What's up, guys? Welcome back to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Tim Tam Tuesday, baby. This is Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020. I am Tim Geddes, and joining me for the very first time on this show and the very first time I have ever done a show with him, so I'm very excited about this, Tamar Hussein from Tim I'm Spot. very excited, too. I'm glad to be here. I, in, in honor of our first show together, I spent the morning watching Vin Diesel videos and mm -hmm. uh listening to his beats so i'm fired up i even like i've i've like been trying to evoke energy from different members of the kind of kind of funny crew so i like uh i introduced some uh un, un uh untested tech into my uh uh into my setup in honor yeah. of kevin that hurts i drank I, test <laughs> <laughs> I, I drank a busan um, oh shit okay wow you're getting real red uh, yeah i've been practicing my comedy routines and i know uh, even though i have nowhere to actually use them for uh -huh. in honor of nick uh-huh um i clicked some head this morning click some heads done um mm -hmm. you know I, I i'm ready i put i put together a tulpa of kind of I funny energy I appreciate it, man, and I, I'm loving it. I'm here for it because we're going to need it today. This is a this is the unholiest of Tuesdays that I think we've had in, in quite a while. Obviously, it's election day in America. Go vote, please. Do it today. You have to save our country. Uh, but in addition to that, it is oh, probably because of that. It's a very weird video game news day where mm. there is nothing happening that is like super exciting. Oh, but we got a packed show for you of a lot of stuff that I promise you by the end of this show you're going to be like, huh. Not one of those things was very interesting, but together, it was a pretty good show. So let's get into it because this is Kind of Funny Games Daily each and every weekday right here on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. We come at you live with all of the video game news you need to know. You can watch it later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames or on roosterteeth.com. If you want to listen to it as a podcast, we're right there for you in your ears on a podcast service of your choice. Just search for Kinda Funny Games Daily. If you want to get the show ad-free and if you want to get the exclusive post show, you can go to patreon.com slash kindoffunnygames just like our Patreon producers James Davis at James Davis makes blackjack and Tom Bach did. Thank you all very, very much. A little bit of housekeeping for you. Extra Life is happening this Saturday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. You can catch the entire Kind of Funny crew and all of our shenanigans for 12 hours straight as we'll be raising money for the Children's Miracle Network of Hospitals. You can catch it all going down live right here on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games also community stream hosting starts friday at 1 p.m pacific and remember you can go to kind of funny.com slash extra life to join the team or donate we'd appreciate it very very much uh, if you can't tell it's been a crazy week here it's going to continue to be a crazy week here on kind of funny whole bunch of fun embargoes whole bunch of fun things to talk about later in the week uh ps i love you will be posting friday as opposed to tuesday i wonder why Think about it. You know what I mean? Uh, today, we're brought to you by Quip and DoorDash, but I'll tell you about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. It's time for some news. He's coming. He's coming. Ten news stories. Possibly a record. Possibly a record for me being on the show. It's a lot. Normally, we're around the six range, and that feels good. Ten seems ridiculous, egregious, some would say. What do you think, Tam? I think that's a, it's a lot, but it's good. We mm -hmm. need a lot to keep our minds off of other things right now, and I feel like ten new stories is getting a lot of mileage out of, like, escapism um, exactly. into, into the gaming news world. And like I said, nothing too mind-blowing, nothing too crazy, but... Let's start off with some of it. Gran Turismo 7 reportedly aiming to launch in the first half of 2021. This comes from Jordan Alleman at IGN. As reported by GT Planet, a YouTube advertisement for the PlayStation 5 shows an image from the game. The screenshot is accompanied by a small piece of text which reads, Now, Tam, I'm going to have you read this. Uh, I'm not going to <laughs> Excuse me. I hope Jen doesn't see this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorti preview. Pour la premiere moti de 2021. Which, when translated, Fucking reads, it, release scheduled for the first half of 2021. You honestly nailed that. I am very <laughs> impressed, and I'm happy I didn't have to do it. Uh, Sony has yet to announce an official release date for Gran Turismo 7, which was revealed back in June of this year. But this advertisement suggests that we might see GT7 release within the PS5's launch window at some point in early 2021. Uh, the advertisement is yet to be verified by multiple sources, so do take it with just a pinch of salt. 
What do you think, Tam? I mean, I, it makes perfect sense to me. One of the things that I think a lot of people forget, especially in this day and age when Gran Turismo isn't hot as as hot and as heavy as it used to be, is mm -hmm. perhaps this is overstating it, but Gran Turismo has a massive amount of pulling power for people outside of the gaming community. Um, I would liken it almost to not as as effective but in the same kind of like potential as games like fifa madden and and a lot of the kind of you know sports titles um this is perhaps anecdotally but i know that it was this way for multiple generations of playstation hardware um at very least ps2 definitely ps3 um a lot of my friends and gaming community and when i worked in retail a lot of people would come in and ask for gran turismo gran turismo was the game that was like oh is there a gran turismo yet Yes or no, if it was a yes, they'll be like, okay, now I'm buying a PlayStation 2. It's the game that I feel like a lot of non-gamers or like casual gamers or people who like dally in gaming understand to be the technical showpiece for, for the console, the PlayStation. And I feel like Sony knows that. And mm -hmm. they do that. You know, they do the prelude thing a lot of times and they do the uh, main game. And it's always like they're very tech focused when they're marketing that game. So it makes a lot of sense for me that they would aim for the first half of 2021. Um, they've got a bunch of games to carry them through into the year, uh, new year, but if they need something to kind of draw attention from a wider market, as well as a gaming, uh, passionate gaming base, I feel like Gran Turismo is the one to do it. It makes perfect sense to be the ne next game to kind of take the baton in the relay race that is continuing the kind of interest and keeping the attention on PlayStation 5 into the next year. So who knows whether it's true. I feel like it would be smart if that was the case. And I feel like it's got a decent chance of being the case. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree that I believe it. I definitely believe that they're aiming to launch. Will it actually hit that? I think that's a, a bigger question. Gran Turismo, if I remember correctly, has a history of uh, kind of getting delayed or getting pushed back and not really hitting the, the marks of where they're trying to get. I totally agree with you that back in the day, especially like Gran Turismo was the showpiece title. Like I remember not being interested in, to this day, not being interested in like the more sim racing stuff. Uh, but I made it a point to go to Blockbuster and rent Gran Turismo 3 a spec because I needed to see it on the PlayStation 2. Like I needed to see what video games could look like at the time. Um, mm. and I think things have changed now, but like, to me, it's funny actually having you on the show now, cause I was just talking to Greg about this. Like for me now with the PS five, demon souls is going to be that where definitely not a genre I'm traditionally into, but I got to give that thing a shot just because of how great it looks. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's a stunning game. Um, I won't go too hard into demon souls and why I'm excited about it, but uh, this is a Gran Turismo story, but yeah, <laughs> it's one of those games where I'm like, this is, it's, it's wild that. Uh, this is something I think about constantly. It's while well that the two major games or the games that I'm at the very least most excited about at launch are franchises that a few years ago would be described as niche. For for PlayStation 5, it's uh, the Souls franchise. That first Souls game was like... Demon Souls is so niche that even Shuhei Yoshida said it sucked when he first saw it. <laughs> That's the kind of game it is. He, you know, even he understood it, but then obviously he went back and corrected that. And for Xbox, it's Yakuza. Like Yakuza 7 mm. is like, if you had told me a few years ago that Sony and Microsoft would be like placing their eggs in the Yakuza and Souls baskets, I would be like, you're mad. But yeah, the, the, returning to Gran Turismo, the question I have for you is, um, do you think they do the, the full game release or do you think they do the a spec prelude style thing and also do you think there's a a free to play variant of it available Ooh, interesting interesting i i do think that it, this so this is gran turismo 7 so i think that they're trying to put it out just as the full title mm -hmm. full seven and that wouldn't surprise me it it's weird that gran turismo that i feel like gran turismo was the first franchise or one of the first franchises that we all talked about last generation as why isn't it just a platform it should just be a platform that they just keep adding to and we've seen that now happen with so many other games and now ironically i kind of feel like that doesn't work for gran turismo anymore for how mm -hmm. the the game works where it's like i do think it, it deserves a, a a new entry in the franchise like with that wow factor of the next gen hardware and all the things that can come with it so i i think it's going to be a, a full standalone title i do think it's going to come first half of 2021 continuing playstation's uh like you, you the baton race thing you said was was so great like mm -hmm. there's so many titles we know are coming and there's a chance that playstation just owns from launch all the way through the end of 2021 with hits 
every couple months with the likes of Horizon and Ratchet and Clank and God of War and all the other things that we don't even know. So mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, speaking of those, by the way, story number two, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart is only coming to PlayStation 5. Insomniac confirms. Uh, this comes from Alessandro over at GameSpot. Uh, responding to a question on Twitter, the official Insomniac Games answered unequivocally that the latest entry in the PlayStation franchise will only be coming to PlayStation 5. Concerning all the dimension hopping that the gameplay seems to feature, it makes sense that those mechanics might require the speed of the SSD that isn't present in Sony's other older consoles kev can you bring up this tweet from spidey 889 please good so on brand I'm on uh, on. username there yeah big uh <laughs> mega fan of spider-man uh tweeted at insomniac games hey guys i'm not sure if you already answered this but i was curious will ratchet and clank rift apart be coming to playstation 4 as well or just the ps5 and insomniac replied it's a ps5 exclusive straight up there wasn't any any extra stuff just boom there's the mm-hmm. answer does this surprise you? Not at all. Like it's the, again, they've been using Ratchet and Clank for showing off their SSD technology and the instant loading time. Like they call it Rift Apart for a reason. Like that's very much the gimmick of the game, and it would be kind of a bad look if the gimmick of the game didn't work or was hobbled in some way in uh, by being placed on an, another um, console. Like the PlayStation Four probably can't do that Rift style stuff. Um, as well imagine a rift opening and then you're just hanging about waiting for it to load in the background (laughs) or there's an actual like loading sequence i understand um that why people might be thinking that and honestly like i kind of if they did put it on there and made it like work in a and market it as like hey this ain't gonna work like you think it is i would even respect that there's one trillion ps4s out there so like you gotta make that money but i'm not surprised that it's on ps5 and staying that way if it's going anywhere else chances are it'd probably be like a pc or something like that but that's a whole other kettle of fish that um Mm -hmm. sony is doing their best not to look at and and distract people from but yeah i'm not surprised that it's it's coming to exclusively to ps5 i guess that it needs to be that way Mm -hmm. so you're not surprised the ratchet clank were you Mm. surprised that miles morales and horizon were both not exclusive to ps5 not really like i said the the surprise stuff like it kind of feels like what comes to previous gen and current gen is very much defined by the tech pushing it like the demon souls can't come there because it's built on tech that the ps4 just is incapable of kind of even working with same for ratchet i don't think that's the same case entirely for horizon and miles they are very much like they're able to scale it in a way that makes sense um and like I said, the, the main concern for Sony is there's a lot of PS4s out there. And they're like, if it's easy to make that happen, it makes too much sense for, for them. Like Spider-Man, that's a huge, 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 huge <coughs> franchise, especially now. Um, and the amount of PS4s out there is massive. The amount of PS4s that played, P- owners that bought the original Spider-Man, you know, there were stories back in the day when it first came out about it being one of the best first party titles um ever released by sony it's they they got a leverage that it would be just leaving too much money on the table for them to to kind of leave it there and the same with horizon horizon new ip obviously but did gangbusters and in the time since horizon released became elevated as a playstation franchise and aloy Aloy became a kind of mascot so even if you didn't play horizon back then when it first came out in the time since you've kind of absorbed the importance of that franchise through osmosis so there's a decent chance that when a new entry in that franchise comes out and you've got a PlayStation 4, you'd be like, I'm into this. I'm going to try to check it out. Yeah. See, I, I wasn't surprised at all about, about Spider-Man, but Horizon definitely surprised me. It's Once I you know got more information about it and thought about it, I was like, okay, I can see this makes sense. But especially given all the stuff PlayStation was saying about Generations Matter and all that, it was like, wait, what? <laughs> this game, this the major showcase game that we were all predicting was going to happen sooner than later on the PS5 is not exclusive. At this point, I don't think it's really going to matter too much, but it definitely, it did surprise me. Uh, next story, sticking with Insomniac, Kev, if you can bring up this tweet from James Stevenson, Stevenson, who is the community manager over at uh, Insomniac, community director. He says, we're at that time when copies of the game start getting out into people's hands from all sorts of sources. So if you care about spoilers, whether they be for the story or suits we haven't shown, be careful. 
this is where we're at news story wise today that's what i'm talking about of like no shit a game's coming out be careful spoilers are there uh i just thought it was an interesting talking point here where i'm so stoked that this game is a week away we're going to be able to play it tam what's your hype levels for spider-man miles morales it's pretty i mean how how truthful am i allowed to be right now (laughs) I, I'm very, very excited for others to play it. I'm very, gotcha, very excited gotcha, for others gotcha. to play it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you can see what that is over there. Oh, there you go. Well, there you go. Um, I yeah. hate you a lot right now. <laughs> Just want you to know that. Uh, but anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cool. Yeah, that was really cool. You know what that, mean? Was cool. that was cool. That was really cool. Uh, <laughs> no, so uh, I will say I am extremely excited, and I'm very excited to see what the the suits are. I think that with Spider Man uh, the One, uh, there was so many like fun suits that were such surprises, and I remember playing through. Like I remember Greg played it before me, um, and he was texting me. He's like, "Dude, tell me when you there's a, a suit you'll get. You'll know what it is. Mm-hmm. Like this is it's going to be exciting." And I loved that there was multiple suits that I texted him about like, Oh shit. Was it this one? He's like, Oh no, no, no. It's not that one. It's yeah. a different one. Like, I think that they did such a good job of having more than a couple dope suits that we didn't expect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they also didn't have a lot of the ones we did expect, which I think shows a lot of restraint. So them showing in miles Morales the spider verse costume already. Uh, I'm kind of like, what surprises do they have for us? Like that could be, that could be kind of fun yeah i'm kind of bummed that they showed that one i understand why they showed that one i would love to have been like oh man they've got the spider-verse uh suit in here and then to see how it actually impacts the game that would have been so cool i i mean into the spider-verse one of the best movies in many many years if not all time Mm -hmm. um massive passionate following makes perfect sense to market it alongside a game about miles morales and show people that it's there um but I would have loved for people to kind of discover that and it become a new story ahead of time uh, while it was happening, you know, in the thick of it. It's not gonna, it's not, it doesn't lose anything for, for them showing that off. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of cool stuff in it, potentially that could be in that game um, that I'm excited to see everyone kind Absolutely. of pick away at and, and, and express their love of. That's the thing about this game. Um, and Spider Man as a whole, like the original Spider Man, the reason I love playing it is like, it encouraged you to tell people how much you love Spider-Man. And I feel like that's the same thing that but like the Arkham games do and all good games, really. Like if I'm playing Street Fighter V, whatever, when it first came out, I was just so excited about seeing Ryu and Ken's and you know, Akuma's new animations or whatever like that. And it, it, it encouraged me to go to it and be like, look at this cool stuff in this game. And I love games that do that. And the original Spider-Man definitely do that. And I expect this new uh, Miles Morales game is going to do that the same. Yeah, absolutely, man. Very exciting stuff. Uh, And then in much less exciting stuff, but it's an interesting kind of PSA here. uh, Sony confirms to GamePro that the HDMI cable with the PS5 is the right one that you Mm -hmm. need for all the next-gen features. At this point, we want to correct the spread of misinformation regarding the HDMI 2.1 cable of the PS5. As Sony confirmed, it is an HDMI 2.1 cable. We apologize for the confusion. Complete rectification. At this point, we want to correct the spread of misinformation regarding the cable of the PS5. Uh, The general confusion arose from the fact that the PS5 cable that came with the package did not have the label Ultra High Speed specifically intended for HDMI 2.1 cables. The label should always be on a cable with 2.1 standard according to interview uh but since only high speed was found here we assumed the the cable was not the correct cable this is a fucking mess this is such (laughs) a goddamn disaster why does the cable not say the right thing like that is so bad and shitty in a world we've grown up tam with Mm. the knowledge of don't waste your money on fancy hdmi cables they're all the same like don't go to best buy and buy the monster cable buy it on mono price for like three dollars like it's all the same that's all out the window now Cables. Oh, mono price still sells good affordable cables, though. Well, they, they, they absolutely price. do. They absolutely <laughs> do. But all HDMI cables are not all the same anymore. That's the one hmm. thing that's out the window. You need the right cable for uh, next gen to be able to get the variable refresh rates and to be able to get like that stuff. And the thing there is HDMI 2.1 cables don't exist. Like it's HDMI 2.1 ports on uh on graphics cards or on consoles or on tvs the cable itself is just about how high speed the cable is so with that you just need to make sure that you're getting the ultra high speed cable that that gives you the the thorough put that you need for the information 
And I have never seen an ultra high speed cable not say ultra high speed on it. So what the fuck, PlayStation? <laughs> it's wild. And like the fact that it took them this long is the issue. Like it, if they had immediately come out and said, no, 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 no that's that, that is the right cable. Don't worry about it. That would have been fine. But it just yeah. it lingered for a bit too long. And yeah. now there's just enough doubt and it's been spread through word of mouth that it might not be the right cable. Like people are, I don't know like how, how likely it is, but like you might have had some people be like, oh, I need to buy a better cable. And totally. I don't want to be in a situation where my PS5 arrives and I don't have the best cable. So they've like ordered the cable already. That sucks. Like you don't want to do that. And, and it also feeds into that like classic consumer capitalism thing where there's if there's even a like a marginally different new kind of technology everyone does the thing where they get a normal thing and they hike up the price and they put a gold plating on it and like this is the best thing you can get and i feel like it's in the tech industry's interest to avoid that like because it slows down the sale and propagation of that item which means it takes more more time for it to penetrate into the mass market and for it to become a thing that people want to buy immediately instead of like, I can't buy that, it's a $40 cable, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a massive mess. Yeah. Somewhere somewhere in Sony, someone's getting told off for not adding the word ultra to a box or yeah. whatever. And it's just like, this is all a mess. Like It on. is, but we just need consistency, man. Like I, yeah. I'm just so bummed that it, with both USB-C and with HDMI, with this, this 2.1 world win, I just feel like they're just dropping the ball so much. And, yeah. And what should just be a simple future. But what's simple for you guys at home, the PS5 and the Xbox One Series S X come with the right cable. They come with what you need. That's mm -hmm. all you need to know. We can be happy and we can move on. Just like we're about to move on to our next story. The PS5 DualSense teardown reveals how sophisticated the adaptive triggers really are. Uh, this comes from Darren Bontheis at GameSpot. Uh, Kev, if you could bring up this YouTube video. I would appreciate that very much and just kind of skim through it a bit. YouTuber Tronix Fix got his hands on one of the controllers and pried it open to see not just how much technology Sony had managed to fit inside of it. He said he wanted to gauge how easily a broken DualSense would be to repair, but he also took a closer look at the variable triggers. Compared to the DualShock 4, the DualSense is a far more advanced controller, and the triggers alone showcase a design that uses more sophisticated technology to deliver haptic feedback. A spiral gear is used to change the resistance on the adaptive trigger, allowing for games such as Deathloop to simulate a gun being jammed or the feeling of drawing a bow to shoot an arrow. The entire assembly makes use of a modular design, allowing for parts to be more easily replaced should they be broken. While the DualSense does have advanced rumble features, Dr Tronics Fix did note that the analog sticks were nearly identical and could also be prone to drift issues that DualShock 4 occasionally suffered from. It also has a beefier 1560 MA battery to handle all the new haptic features, uh, which YouTuber Austin Evans discovered in his own teardown that was resulted in him accidentally breaking part of it <laughs> so tam i'm happy i have you here for this you mm -hmm. have this controller you can I give do. your impressions on it you've played some of that astro uh astro boy astro bot astro, astro astro's playroom astro just astro, astro astro's, astro's playroom. playroom yeah yeah what are your uh, thoughts on the the controller so i'm limited to what i played in that astro's uh uh one level which everyone has been showing off and i think i can give general impressions of it which i have done before on previous shows um on gamespot.com so i will say it's it's the one thing that immediately feels next gen about the console like overwhelmingly and i'm not for controller gimmicks i don't find it all that exciting usually um when they did the whole um Xbox One controller, Forza, you, you can feel when you're on a different terrain with your cars. I was like, I'm sh yeah, sure, um, you can, but how does that enhance the gameplay experience? I think potentially what we have here with the DualSense is a gimmick that could have meaningful changes in the way you play a game. Um, so in terms of Astro, like it does do the basic stuff where, you know, walking on surfaces and et cetera, et cetera. But there, the tension stuff is really, really cool. Like I think you you see in that level um, that you're able to change, you know, the the form of Astro and get inside other mechs and that kind of stuff. And that does have a knock on effect of the on the controller um, and how you play. So I w I'm going to be careful in how much I share about the play part of it because it potentially could drift into embargo territory but what i will say like i'm i'm more available to talk about the physical form and over the last week and a half two weeks that i've had the controller it's 
I really warm to holding it and like it's fe it feels comfortable. It's not as light uh, as the Dual DualShock 4, which, you know, felt almost kind of flimsy. It feels almost kind of flimsy by comparison, um, but it's not too heavy. It feels like the, the Elite 2, for example, is probably my favorite controller right now, but it does feel a bit heavy. It feels like you, you kind of want to rest it on something as you're playing as well. This feels like a good weight distribution in between. Um, the, the whole kind of like feeling of pressing buttons. I thought I might have some issue with the the face buttons, which feel like they might be a bit more clicky, but they're not. They feel good. Um, same with the triggers and the touchpad. It's it's a really nice controller. I think the one thing that people might quickly realize is if you are a sweaty handed gamer, like I can be, um, the the coloration of that white controller changes very quickly. Oh no, <laughs> Kevin, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I was gonna Don't say, Kevin, into if this, you're... bro, come on. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 my hands are gonna get sweaty. I'll wipe it down. It's fine. Uh, yeah, it just because, <laughs> like, I used it for a, a, an extended session of a video game, and then I looked at it and I was like, "Why am I? Why am I so gross? Like, why is this happening? <laughs> I feel oh, bad about games. myself." But, but then, like, it, it's a quick wipe down, and and you're good. And as we all know, it's like. You know, if you zoom in close enough, you can see that the textured grip on the PlayStation Dual Sense is made out of X's and O's and triangles. So there's probably a bit of dirt trapped in there. But you know, don't go licking your controller after you've used it. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, like, just I'll right. do what I want with my controller. <laughs> I mean, oh. it's your if your it's your bacteria. So if you're just putting it back inside of yourself, should be fine. No worries. <laughs> That's um, how that works. You're just making it stronger each time. Hell oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Kevin Coelho way. Uh, Ignacio Rojas writes in and says, what's up, Tim Tam? Lately, we've seen more and more developers make use of the DualSense's adaptive triggers. We expected first-party studios to make use of the feature, but we also know that Deathloop, Fortnite, and now Resident Evil Village, to name a few, will be using the adaptive triggers in one way or another. Do you expect this support from third parties to keep going throughout the generation, or are adaptive triggers just a gimmick that's going to be used with early games and dropped quickly? Hmm. That's an interesting one. Uh, it kind of all rests on Sony and whether they um, enforce it. I hope they do because, like I said, it does feel like a gimmick initially. But the more games you play or the longer you play with it, the more it starts to feel like it has a lot of potential. It could do really interesting things. Like the gun jamming thing is an obvious one, but there's so much more potential for it. Like it feels like, remember when Gears of War did active reload for the first time? And it was like, you looked at it and you were like, that's just stupid. It's like a small rhythm game thing. And then you did it in the heat of battle and you got the, you know, souped up bullets for that one enemy that was charging towards you and you nailed it and you're like, okay, I understand. It feels yeah. a lot like that where you're like, imagine you could have that same kind of experience where in the heat of the moment, the controller is challenging you on another layer um, or even just enhancing the experience. I feel like it's, there is a lot of potential, like I've said, and it does all... You know, Sony and Microsoft, they can mandate things, be in 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 their in any game released on their platform. And my hope is that they have that mandated, like you better have a good use of this um feature of the dual sense. And it's just a matter of whether developers do do kind of the thing where it's like, okay, let's just put two achievements in there, both five hundred points each, and it will add up to a thousand and mm -hmm. we're good. Or if they do the thing where, where they're like, oh, this is really, this works and we can design around it. And it tends to be historically first party studios that do that, which is why it works really well in Astro, uh, Astro's Playroom. But I hope that there's enough interest in it that developers kind of lean towards it. I could see someone like a Kojima being like, I can figure this out. Can you imagine Kojima oh with a God. sense? Yeah. Oh, man. Holy shit. That's scary. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people have said it, but like, it's such a shame that Death Stranding came out when it did. Like this game with Death Stranding, like Death Stranding with this kind of like vibration and resistance, like as you're trying to climb up a like the side of a rock face with too much cargo, like having the resistance on the triggers make it more difficult and the vibration when you tumble down somewhere, that could have been so cool. But like from the from the team that gave you, put your controller down so we'll vibrate and make it move. I want to yeah. see what happens with the dual sense. Totally. That that's a really, really, really good point. I, I'm kind of with you where I wish that they would do that. I just don't expect that they're going to. I feel like we've seen this type of stuff so many times before where I mean, even with like the touchpad on the the DualShock 4, it's like, yeah, it's it's put to use in some games, but for the most part, it's just a glorified button, mm -hmm. you know? 
Yeah. And I, I hope that 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 we see some more interesting uses of it. I, I like that it it does seem like there's more uses of the gimmick early on than than traditionally for this type of thing. So maybe that's a sign of things to come. And I do think that we're moving towards a generation where when you're looking at PlayStation and Xbox, there is a bigger difference between the two than we've seen in generations. So mm. there is more of a chance of PlayStation getting kind of a different focus than, than Xbox uh, for at least specific types of games. So hopefully we see some more uh, good uses of it. The Big Cat writes in and says, what's up, guys? A few months ago, I wrote in about Ape Escape and was met with apathy. But now that the hour of the PS5 is close, is it time to let the apes escape? Ape Escape was always a game to show off the neat features of the PlayStation, specifically the controller. With the new features of the DualSense, do you think there's even a glimmer of hope that we may get a new Ape Escape game or even a remake anytime soon? Thanks, and hashtag let the apes escape. <laughs> I mean, it's it would be nice, but we are talking about Konami here, and Konami is currently uh, not doesn't seem to be super interested in making new games and digging out old franchises. You know, um, it's more about like ports, I believe. I am right in saying it's Konami, isn't it? No, you, I, are you? You said that. I, I googled it because I'm like, uh -huh. I, could, I could swear the the reason I. I, I say Konami is is connected to Metal Gear in my mind more than itself. Yeah. Um, you know, the apes from Ape Escape came in like Metal Gear Three, and you could like shoot them in in the face. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a maybe... Sony thing. It's Sony. It's Japan Studio. But okay, my bad there. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I guess. I guess. I mean, again, even less so. Like, <laughs> is 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 the Ape Escape franchise on the top of Sony's pile? Probably not, man. Like yeah. it felt, it felt like Ape Escape would work, worked in an era of mascots promoting consoles, right? And being like the the kind of thing that people gravitate towards these days. It's less less the case. Like technology sells consoles as much as these wild monkeys running around and throwing shit about it do. So I would love to see a new Ape Escape game, um, but I don't know if if like I I would like to see a new Ape Escape game in a another game in the same way that. Um, in the same way that they did it for Metal Gear. Like, ch chuck an ape in Ragnarok. <laughs> chuck an ape. Like, just have a... Just see what happens, yeah. man. Yeah, just see what happens. Just have, like, an ape wander into a road in Gran Turismo 7. Just escapes into it, yeah, man. Just like, I've, yeah. I've never been uh, the biggest ape escape guy, but I did in enjoy it for what it was. And I, I liked its use of the DualShock and, you know, of the analog sticks. Like, that being the whole kind of <laughs> conceit of the game. Yeah. Um, I do think that... I agree with you that the, the days of the mascot are over, but I think that we're seeing a kind of new rise again of yeah. them not being the system sellers that Crash Bandicoot used to be, but like it crashes back, you know, like mm. we're, we're seeing the uh, type of uh, new, new interest in, in these games. But I do think that Astro is what we're getting instead of Ape Escape to show off the, the dual sense. And yeah. I, I think that we very well could have got an Ape Escape game at launch and we didn't. So yeah. I, I don't think that uh, we're going to, to end up getting that. I'm sorry, the big cat. But maybe one day we will let the apes Having escape. said that, like, if, if we're playing Gran Turismo 7 and you can, like, look to your left and you see the driver of the car next to you is just an ape, like, driving <laughs> into that. Like, just start being annoying with them. Just, just get them everywhere. Them. Yeah, let's, them everywhere. Let's make, uh, let's make the, the apes from Ape Escape the Stan Lees of Sony games. <laughs> yeah. And just, like, see what happens. <laughs> uh, anyways, story number six. Uh, this is a quick one. In multiple ways. The Witcher 3 on Xbox Series X has no load screens for fast travel. This comes from James O'Connor at GameSpot. Thanks to one streamer's video of The Witcher 3 running on a Series X, we can check out the advantages of super boosted loading times. YouTuber RUBHEN925 has shared nearly two hours of footage showing the game running on the new system. While the full video is worth a watch, the most exciting part, funnily enough, comes when fast travel is used. The gift from the video below happens just past the one hour 14 minute mark in the video, and it shows what happens when you fast travel. There's no loading screen now. In fact, the environment loads so fast, it kind of looks like a glitch. Kev, if you could bring this up, please. This is a kind of ridiculous and really a taste of what next gen is about to to bring to us, at least in terms of older games. And I still think with new games, it's going to be so crazy. It's very impressive, yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> like, damn! Like, it's yeah. distracting and weird how fast it is. Yeah, I think the thing that they say is the main takeaway. Like, it's so quick that 
the game even is like it's like the, the game's been caught with his pants down in the toilet like someone's just walking <laughs> on it and it's like what the hell you shouldn't be here um but <laughs> yeah it is like i i am um, crazy man I, All right. yeah i do i do wonder like how I, I like I, I can't remember how far like the 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 fast travel was like is it a bit slower when you try to load like further away in the map uh, you know the world if the world is massive like a skyrim or something um like if you're loading from one side to the other is there any noticeable impact um mm-hmm. and like i it is incredibly exciting for older games i do wonder how scalable it is to modern games like i think modern games will load fast but that thing is going to happen where We've got a whole new, you know, set of tools to work with and a lot of power. So developers are going to create more intricate, more detailed worlds where fast travel might end up feeling kind of the same because it's not loading like old gen assets. It's loading incredibly detailed new textures and physics and doing all these calculating calculations. So although it will be quick, maybe it's not this quick. Yeah, um, it won't be. So, it won't be too fast. It'll be like yeah. the right the right amount of time. Like the right amount of time that you should be brushing your teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is brought to you by Quip. There are only two types of people in the world. Those of us who brush and floss every day and those who just might start thanks to Quip's new refillable floss pack. You know Quip. Quip are the toothbrush that are keeping you honest, making sure that you are brushing the proper two minutes a day. I've talked about it so many different times. There's the nice little vibration going on that lets you know to change the quadrant in your mouth to make sure you're getting that nice, even clean all around your mouth. The durable handle is easy to guide, restrings with a click, and comes with a compact mirror dispensing case on the go for or the floss a uh, single refill pod replaces over 180 single use plastic flossers so it's better for your teeth and the environment you can pair your floss with the perfect electric toothbrush which i've been using i love it quip has the simple guiding features you need like the time sonic vibrations that i'm telling you all about and guiding pulses to help you brush better quip also delivers brush heads floss and toothpaste refills every three months from five dollars shipping is free so you can save money and skip the store uh bring delight to your everyday brushing and join the over five million mouths brushing with quip starting at 25 dollars. if you go to getquip.com slash games right now you'll get your first refill free that's your first refill free at getquip.com slash games g-e-t-q-u-i-p.com slash games and next up shout out to doordash oh man do we love doordash here kind of funny between never-ending laundry cycles and incoming emails you've got plenty on your to-do list give yourself one less thing to worry about and let doordash take care of your next meal did joey order some taco bell last night yeah she did was it fantastic absolutely did i eat some Mm -hmm. that's how things work in this household doordash (laughs) is the app that brings you food you're craving right now right to your door ordering is easy open the doordash app choose what you want to eat and your food will be left safely outside your door with the new contactless delivery drop-off setting. Uh, with over 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, you can support your local go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants. Like what, Kevin? Red Robin. Yep. Cheesecake Factory, Chipotle, Wendy's. It's all there for you, man. <laughs> Many of your favorite local restaurants are still open for delivery. Just open the DoorDash app, make your favorite local or select your favorite local restaurant, and your food will be left at your door. Uh, DoorDash deliveries are now contactless to keep communities we operate in safe. Right now, you guys can get $5 off and zero delivery freeze on your first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code GAMES. That's $5 off your end, zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code games don't forget that's code games for five dollars off your first order with door dash back Tim, to the show yes if i may mm-hmm. i know that you have a history of being rated on your segues mm-hmm. and nick isn't here to give you shit mm-hmm. neither is andy or anyone else so mm-hmm. i would like to take the opportunity to say that i think that was a 10 out of 10 segue Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, is, I am very proud this, of it. Myself. This is the Tim Tam show where we support mm-hmm. each other. Um, and I just wanted you to know that I think your segues are usually at least an eight to 10. This was a 10, but I've never heard a segue that's below an eight, if I'm honest. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. I think you're a 10 out of 10 human being. Kevin, what <laughs> bullshit are you about to bring into this? Did you see that? Did you see, that? Did you see what I did I love, there? I love your sweater. Uh, 8.75 out of 10. Not bad, yeah, Tim. Yeah, that was yeah, pretty yeah. good. <laughs> But I had, okay? it I had it in. I had it. That was pretty good. That was pretty <laughs> good. That was pretty good. It was not on purpose. <laughs> I was like, why, why did I write a five out of ten? I thought I wrote eight point seven five out of ten. All right. 
I love this show. I love this show so much. Let's keep it going. Uh, and speaking of big numbers, man, we got some crazy ones here. Activision Blizzard made $1.2 billion from microtransactions in just three months. Uh, this comes from Eddie over at GameSpot. Activision Blizzard has reported new financial numbers for the July-September period, and it was a gigantic quarter for the gaming publisher. One section of the company's business that did particularly well was microtransactions. For the three-month period, Activision Blizzard made $1.2 billion which are called uh, for microtransactions which are called in-game net bookings this is a dramatic very nice 69 percent improvement over the same period last year when activision blizzard made 709 million from these microtransactions uh for the latest reporting period activision blizzard made 1.95 billion in revenue from all of its stuff so the 1.2 billion for microtransactions represents more than half of the company's total revenue Activision's Call of Duty franchise was a bright spot for the microtransactions. Uh, the sales for Modern Warfare and the Battle Royale game Warzone were four times higher than the same period last year. Growth was always expected, far with far more players jumping into Call of Duty than usual this year. Uh, a lot of help with Warzone. Additionally, Activision reported that Modern Warfare's first year sales are the highest in Call of Duty history, and two-thirds of sales came digitally. Does any of this surprise you? Not really. I think, uh, yeah, Michael, Michael transactions, as I call him, uh, strikes again. Um, <laughs> it makes it makes perfect sense that it would be like the the conditions for Activision to make a lot of money right now are pretty much perfect. Like they've got one of the most beloved first person shooter franchises. They've got as there's a very, very good battle royale version of it. Um, and, you know, people are stuck inside where you know it's an easy to access game and then if they go on twitch pretty much everyone is playing it there it's got a really healthy community it's generating memes it's generating hype online you've got the biggest streamers in the world playing it and you know they actually like credit where credit is due the stuff that they sell it's weird and obtuse to get, but like a lot of the stuff in there is cool. Like, so if you're into the idea of committing to a game and want to spend money, whether it's on a battle pass or cosmetics or that kind of stuff, you're getting a decent amount of money's worth out of it. And there's a, there's like a immediate show off factor to everything. So they are, they are in a pretty good position right now. The, the rich keep getting richer, but damn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the two things that, well, the one thing that does surprise me is that Modern Warfare's first year sales are the highest in Call of Duty history. Like, it's just one of the, those things that it shouldn't surprise me. But I do kind of feel like we're Call of Duty out to the point that I wouldn't think that we're still outselling year over year over year. But apparently they are. So good on them. Yeah, there, there was a dip a little while back where it started to kind of like, it was like people were like, oh, is, is Call of Ghost, Duty done? Right? Yeah, around that era, and then even after like Advanced Warfare, that kind of stuff, it was, it was like Activision was still saying we're the best. We've got, we've got, we're making mad money. We're selling more than ever. But it was, you could, it was harder to believe at that time. You could see the slump was happening, and then Warzone came along, and it was just like holy crap! Like it's that's the shot in the arm that kind of the Call of Duty franchise needed, mm -hmm. and now it makes perfect sense that it would soar. A lot of people are buying that game, probably the new one, just to kind of like get into war zone in a new way you know and so it makes perfect sense that we're on an upward tra trajectory for call of duty right now i'm interested to see how long it lasts before people get you know fatigued with it again yeah yeah it's interesting and then the, the other thing that is uh something to keep your eye on two-thirds of sales came digitally the market's shifting the market's mm -hmm. changing man like mm -hmm. with physical is becoming less and less of a thing uh internet's getting better and better places so Keep your eye on that. Kev, I'm actually going to jump over a story to keep with the Call of Duty stuff for a sec. Call of Duty Warzone won't shift engine, even though Black Ops Cold War has. This also comes from Jordan Alleman at IGN. Call of Duty Warzone won't be switching engines when it welcomes content from Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, even though Black Ops Cold War uses a new engine itself. A verified Activision art lead revealed the news on Reset Era. There will not be an engine shift for Warzone. Uh, in response to... wait. 
let me jump ahead of here. This decision means that Warzone should feel broadly the same to play, even while the tools of war you use may be altered drastically by the update, although existing Modern Warfare-themed equipment will remain available to players. Equally, it may mean that playing Warzone and Black Ops Cold War side-by-side -side may take some getting used to. Some players in the same recent era thread are concerned about how the Black Ops Cold War arsenal of weapons will be balanced in Warzone when they make the jump between engines. We're sure we'll hear more about that when the game's integration is detailed further. Kind of interesting. I kind of mm -hmm. expected them to to make the jump over, but that's kind of the weird Wild West we're in right now with Warzone of it being this Call of Duty platform. And as the Call of Duty games continue to exist side by side, we just haven't seen this before because usually with these Battle Royale games, that's all that there is, right? Like, yeah. I mean, Fortnite had it single player, but that was like a different different experience whereas call of duty is kind of there's a that annual expectation of an upgrade what does that look like for warzone yeah that's really interesting actually the the like you said the expectation for call of duty is a jump every year in some meaningful capacity but we have this almost like offshoot now that it's just gonna exist alongside it to work to serve as this reminder of what call of duty is i think they'll it makes perfect sense that they don't want to do it. There's too much going on with that game right now that an engine shift on a live service game could be potentially catastrophic for a really long time. So I don't think they have a reason to do it right now. I think there will eventually be one, but it'll take a little while. Um, and they will probably message it and, and, and kind of prepare everyone for a little bit of downtime way ahead of time. And I think they need to spend a little more time kind of getting people comfortable with new platforms and getting comfortable with developing on new platforms as well for themselves. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that they would do it. I think people will adapt very easily. Warzone, it has been what it has been for what a long time now. People are used to playing it that way. I think there's more likely a chance for people to be upset if they move to a new engine and they were like change i don't like change this is different this is different i hate it i hate it i hate it i think it's easier for the war zone audience who they really pride themselves on understanding and and being completely comfortable with how a game feels because that's related to skill and awareness and that kind of stuff then if they click then, the heads yeah exactly if you if suddenly the heads are a bit too small you're going to be upset about it. You don't care how good the graphics are. The, that, that head might have the most detailed face there is, but if the head is too small because it's different from the last uh, engine, people are going to be upset. So it makes perfect sense that people, that, that at least Activision and Treyarch and the other developers are sticking to what's comfortable right now, especially given how popular it is and how well it's doing. Don't rock the boat if it's smooth sailing currently, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, going back to money conversations here, this story, uh, they Pokemon Go just had to surpass the Activision story. Here we have Activision, three months, $1.2 billion, which is, which is insane. Pokemon Go, and granted, much longer time period, but has surpassed $4 billion in lifetime revenue. Damn. Four. Nice billion dollars from pokemon go this comes from daniel ahmad on twitter uh and that isn't the most interesting stat there's there's a lot more pokemon go surpassed four billion in lifetime revenue according to sensor tower one billion of which has been generated in 2020 so far which makes 2020 the best year for the game on record since 2016. This game's added stay at home features during the lockdown. Just to put this into perspective, Pokemon Sword and Shield has sold 18.2 million units since launch. Assuming they all sold for $60, that's around 1.1 billion in gross revenue. Even if you combine Sword and Shield, Let's Go, Sun and Moon, and Ultra Sun and Moon, that's still less than 3 billion. That's wild. What? That is wild. I mean, yeah, even when you combine those, that's the fact that, I mean, Sword and Shield and the other Pokemon games don't have Michael transaction looming over them. Um, but still, I don't think that should take away from the experience that Niantic and the Pokemon company have put together. There was, like, it's easy to forget now, but there was a time where this game was, like, everywhere the cultural zeitgeist was entirely in its favor it was the thing that everyone did to the point where it was on mainstream news people were solving murders based on discovering bodies because they were out playing you know pokemon <laughs> go and people were like remember there was a point where businesses had to put up signs saying don't bring your pokemon go nonsense to my business mm -hmm. like just because there's a pokestop we don't want you hanging about if you're going to do that at least buy, buy a boba yeah. tea or something 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, like that is that's wild and it's ridiculous. And I think the smartest thing that they did was the stay at home measure stuff. Mm -hmm. Because immediately the first thing I thought was when you know when when the lockdown stuff happened was like oh man what's gonna happen are, to Pokemon yeah, Go what's yeah. what's gonna happen to my Sam's first thought is just like oh man the world we're all work from home we're all yeah we're all work from home place. what's gonna happen to Pokemon Go honestly <laughs> the the actual thought was like is Andrew Goldfarb gonna be okay like <laughs> the the world the world's most like a dedicated Pokemon Go player I was like what's he gonna do he's gonna what's go what's he mad. gonna do. <laughs> uh, so Joe Merrick, a uh, uh, user on Twitter, responded and saying that this makes sense. The monetization has been pushed hard this year. Ticket events at least once a month, remote raid passes, and incense needed to play well during these times. And before then, there were lots of egg events. Uh, and he's saying all this stuff. But like based on the Twitter response, it doesn't seem like they're upset about it. It seems like they're getting a, a good quality experience out of what they're paying for. So yeah, that's good. I'm happy there's a, a good community there. Remember today, Pokemon Go. To the polls. Remember when they did that Ooh, four yeah. years ago? That, Bring it back. Yeah. Bring it back. <laughs> love to see it. Yeah, and you do definitely. love to see it. Um, let's see. Let's see. The final news story of the day. This one, uh, Greg added to the the doc here. Friday the thirteenth, killing dedicated servers. This comes from Friday the thirteenth, the games forum. All things must come to an end eventually. And while that statement might sound ominous, there is a lot to cover and a lot of news to highlight. So please read on dedicated servers for Friday the 13th. The game will be decommissioned in the upcoming patch set to roll out in November 2020. What this means is that the game will revert back to peer-to-peer -peer matchmaking for quick play lobbies. The database servers, however, will stay active and continue to house all player progression and unlocks so users can continue to play the game via peer-to-peer -peer quick play and private matches. Uh, the patch that was going to go live will also be the final patch for the game the team has been hard at work completing fixes for a long list of player issues to include in the final patch uh the official forums will be archived in a locked state so players can still reference the information without posting uh the game will continue to be available for sale and as such will continue to receive the full support of jasonkillsbugs.com as a resource for troubleshooting please continue to use the support site for any assistance needed as for the double xp cp and tape drop rates that we set in the start of the pandemic the team has opted to leave this in indefinitely the team at gun wants to thank each and every player and fan that has made friday the 13th the game what it is today we know this news is hard to hear despite being inevitable we appreciate each and every one of you not yeah. unexpected uh, you hate to see it happen to games greg loved this so much but i'm i'm like honestly um surprised not surprised i'm happy that it went this long like and especially the state that that game came out of it, it was like broken and busted in every single way and it still kind of is very janky and the fact that a community rallied around it and found something to love people like greg and like i played it a bunch of times with a bunch of friends um at ign we used to like get together and and play and you know just hang out and it was a lot of fun um it could have been worse like it could have been that you know they just shut the game down altogether. I know peer-to-peer -peer matchmaking is a little trickier and not as consistent. Mm -hmm. um, but it's good that they have the opportunity to, you know, carry on playing. Is my hope is like fans kind of take over in a, in in a lot of ways. Like they, I would love to see the developers just be like, "It's yours now. Do do with it what you will." And they just kind of create these dedicated servers and improve the matchmaking themselves, and maybe even clean up some of the bugs in the games and and, and like make it their own. Um, probably tricky to do given that Friday the 13th is a licensed property, so they probably won't be able to do that. But I think it's it's had a good run. It's a mm -hmm. fun game. It's a good, good time. Um, and like if you haven't played it, it's probably dirt cheap and maybe just check it out while you can with dedicated servers. Well, I, I, there's a missed opportunity here because they're saying November 2020 for the patch. Mm. Mm. Next Friday. Next Friday. There it is. I'd love the idea of like, them Next coming Friday back. is <laughs> the 13th. There is. There, is. there we go. I'd love the idea of them doing something like resurrecting the game later on because <laughs> you can't keep him down. He's just like bust <laughs> out of the ground. It's like we lied, he's back and he's worse than ever. Oh, Tam. Next Friday <laughs> is, is so so far away. If I want to know what's coming to mom and grab shops today, where would I look? Uh you would look <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm biffing this. What more am I supposed to say? I'm supposed to read this list out. That's what I'm supposed there to do, go. right? There you go. There we go. There yes. we go. There we go. Okay, so out. 
we have uh, the official list of upcoming software yeah. across each and every platform, as listed by the Kind of Funny Games Daily Show's host each and every weekday. So, out oh, we have Nailed it. Fairy. Fairy. Come on, wait. All right. You gotta get the jingle. Oh, the jingle, yes, of course. Top. <laughs> I like that. So, okay. okay, yeah, I'll, I'll let you read the list. Go for it. Fairy, PS4. Jurassic World Evolution Switch. I watched uh, Jurassic World over the last weekend. It's pretty good still. Bakugan Champions. No, it's not. It's fine. It's fine, man. The, the, the movies before it sucked real bad. Like, <sighs> the, oh, and then I, this one. I don't even want to have this yeah. conversation. Uh, <laughs> Bak <laughs> I'm basically I'm basically baiting Kevin here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Bakugan Champions. Switch. Ord. PS4. Spell Force 3, Fallen God, PC. Wow, there's three of these? Hey. <laughs> uh, a hunting Simulator, Switch. Toronos, Switch. Gun Slugs on Switch. My Universe, another Switch game. A lot of Switch games coming out. Mm. My Universe School Teacher, which I've, I have no idea what this is, but it sounds like some weird anime wrong in game, <laughs> which means I have to absolutely download it. Um, Switch, another Switch game, Raw. Um, Project Cars 3, um, today releases the Legends Pack add-on. Um, this is the first of four DLC packs. And then this week on Red Dead Online is giving all traders and moonshiners a boost to their businesses with new rewards alongside the latest bonuses and discounts and limited time clothing additions to the Wheeler, Rawson's, and Co. catalog. You'd love to see it. You'll love to see it. Uh, some deals of the day for you. Stephen Petit at GameSpot says, November's PlayStation Plus freebies for subscribers are now available to claim on PSN, and it's quite possibly one of the best months ever for the program. Hollow Knight, Void Heart Edition, and Middle Earth Shadow of War are up for grabs in November. Both are great games, but the most exciting freebie is the upcoming bonus one. Yes, baby, I'm talking about Bug Snacks. Mm -hmm. uh, the upcoming PlayStation console exclusive will be free for subscribers on launch day. Though Bug Snacks will release on PS5 and PS4 on November 12th, only the PS5 version will be free for PS Plus subscribers. But you'll have a longer longer window than usual to claim bug snacks as the promotion runs until January 4th. So go check that out. Fun stuff. Um, let's see what we're gonna do now. Squad up, baby. Let's do that. You can go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games uh to let people know what game you're playing, where you want some help, and people will come and find you all that stuff. Mizuki writes in and says, hey there, Tim and Tamar. As you and the best friends probably know, Saturday is Extra Life. A group of friends and I will be doing the full 24 hours, uh, plus or minus two, two to four more hours if we hit our goal. So if y'all are up after the Kind of Funny stream, come join us for another 12 hours of fun. You can check them out at twitch.tv slash kingkaiser. That's K-I-N-G-K-A-I-S-E-R. Check them out. Very fun stuff. Extra Life's going to be a blast this weekend. Can't wait to raise some money for those big, beautiful kids. Uh, now it's time to go to You're Wrong to see what we got wrong as we screwed it up live on the show. Uh, Nanobiologist says, not only you're wrong, but a PSA, Tim, can you make a comment that people need to go vote today? Today is the last day to vote for change. I said at the top of the show, and I'll say it again now. Go vote. Let's make a change. Let's make this happen. Let's get Trump out of the White House. Come on. We need to do this. We really need your help. Everybody. Stop Please. thinking about it. Just go do it. Uh, this week's host, Greg and Gary tomorrow. Blessing and me on Thursday. Greg and Blessing on Friday. It's going to be a great time. Uh, hopefully, we're standing. <laughs> hopefully, things are, <laughs> are still going all right. Uh, but anyways, uh, Tan, this has been awesome. Been so stoked to finally get you on a show. Stoked that I got to do a show with you. Yeah. So this can't Thank be the so last. Thank you so much for having me. No, I hope not. We're about uh, to do the post show. Uh, just me and you hanging out for a little bit more. So if you're a patreon.com slash kind of funny game supporter, we'll see you then. Everyone else, Tamar, where can people find you? You can find me doing stuff on GameSpot. Uh, we have a weekly show all about next-gen consoles and games called Generation Next. That's on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash GameSpot. If you want to check out my absolutely awful tweets, you can find me at Tamar H so on good. Twitter. So good. <laughs> um, I've recently started streaming on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv forward slash Tamar H. I've um, been bitten by the, the streaming bug. I feel like I, you know, I'm isolated. I have a lot of free time and not a lot of people to speak to so i thought you know what i'm gonna play metal gear and i'm gonna stream it on the internet so if you feel like i'm awesome. hanging out there um i'm just keeping it simple so i'm not trying to get like subs, subs and that kind of business i've actually just got a charity link there so if you want to support a charity 
where we're doing that as part of Extra Life as well. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Cool. Uh, so we're about to do the post show for Patreon people. If you're not a Patreon person, or even if you are after that, youtube.com slash kind of funny right now has Raul Coley's We Have Cool Friends interview with Greg Miller up. Very cool stuff. Obviously, he's a best friend, has been for years, but uh, he's kind of making moves. Kind of a big deal now. So go check mm-hmm. him out uh, while he still likes to talk to us. But anyways, till next time, love you guys. Bye.